Okay, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming to our first ever graduate research showcase. Uh, this is an event organized by the Graduate Students Association, and they uh, uh, pulled together the, uh, the uh, uh, set of auditions to get some of our great grad students talking to you. We're gonna get a series of five-minute talks um, showcasing a variety of research in the electrical engineering department. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to the uh, director of today's schedule, Chang Chen. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'll just go over some quick logistics to get us uh, going according to schedule. We have nine speakers, which is great, but it also means uh, we'll be very tight on time. So each speaker will only have five minutes, and we only allow one short one minute question. So if you have burning question, you have to be fast and speak loudly. Um, and then we do encourage you to come uh, later uh, after the session to ask your extended in-depth questions. And the speakers will also have their emails uh, on the slide. So feel free to email them. Or you can also email us at TED Talks if you want us to put you in touch. And with that, I'll just turn it over to our first speaker, Yao Yu. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to share with you uh, my research on building circuits uh, inside cells. Uh, so as you may wonder why uh, building circuits in living cells, um, the argument is actually uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, the advancement of electronic circuits has greatly benefited the society in terms of everyone here has a small computer uh, that powered by electronic circuits uh, that can do amazing stuff. Um, so, but in terms of biotechnology, we don't have that uh, similar capabilities. We can barely uh, change a bulb uh, inside a cell uh, similar to that, that capacity. So here, uh, I'm go going to show you a, a very basic circuit I, I built uh, inside e-cells, uh, which is a toggle switch. Uh, so here uh, is a circuit diagram of this uh, switch, uh, which kind of mimics uh, what electronic circuit diagram do. So it explains the logics and uh, the, the wirings behind this. So uh, the blocks, the, uh, the square blocks you see here uh, represents a gene uh, inside a cell, which is like a piece of DNA that can code for proteins. So here the, uh, the square also representing the, uh, the protein that, uh, that the genes coded for. So, and the, the p there's a piece of uh, gene that uh, box that uh, in front of this gene, it's called a promoter. Promoter is a, a DNA sequence that can regulate the expression of the gene. So it can regulate uh, whether the protein is expressed or not, or its uh, rate of expression. So here, the circuit I build uh, can be seen as there's a protein called ZEF, which is a transcript factor that can regulate the promoter, uh, which can regulate the promoter and uh, then regulates the expression of downstream proteins. So ZEF here can be bound by a small molecule called beta Shdao, uh, which is uh, analogous to a human hor hormone, actually, uh, and bound to this promoter called PGLZ. Uh, when it's bound, it can uh, turn on the expression of the protein called Zevni. And here, Zevni is a protein that I literally enge engineered uh, to be able to function as activator uh, that can bind to this promoter. So it, it forms a positive feedback loop here. It's like the positive feedback loop you have in electronic circuits. And so uh, what you imagine is once this uh, uh, Zev protein activates the P uh, PGLZ4 promoter, uh, the Zevni uh, protein will uh, basically form this, uh, this positive feedback loop and sustain uh, the production. And here, we also have a mechanism to, to turn off the production of this protein, which is a protein called tier one DM, which when bound by uh, a plant hormone called auxin, uh, can degrade this protein, uh, Zavni. So this is uh, the parts that we actually uh, engineer to be uh, working in this way. Uh, and if you think of the logics behind the circuit, actually work as a two-state finite state machine. So it can have two states, uh, 
so one is uh, the low expression of this protein, another is the high expression of this protein Zavni. And it can receive two inputs, uh, and depending on the state and the inputs you receive, it switch the states or sustain the states. And I've got to mention this Zavni protein is actually a uh, fluorescence uh, protein uh, added. So uh, the, it's like acti also acting as a readout. So you can see them under uh, microscopy or um, similar equipment, which shines a light on it. Uh, and you can uh, see the uh, light exhibits uh, out from it. And you can see the uh, change of the abundance uh, the protein inside cells. So I. Uh, build the circuit, circuit, insert them into e cells, uh, which is a pretty, pretty hard work. Um, and uh, so, and I experimentally verified this actually works as expected, as we designed. So you can see the the input here is two uh, two small molecules, and when you uh, switch uh, the input of two mo small molecules, you can see the fluorescence output, which is the Zavni abundance inside cells, changes according to the finite state machine design we have. So you can see it turn on and can stay on, it can turn off uh, by oxygen and can stay, stay off. And this can, can do multiple cycles. So this is a pretty good. So we, um, we then moved on to the uh, next steps to see what we can do with this switch. So we, we use this switch as modular circuits to build an antibody reversible antibody resistance memory, uh, which is uh, basically uh, turn on this uh, antibody resistance gene and can, can work as a reversible memory. So with that, I'm going to uh, close my talk uh, with code that inspires uh, everyone in this field, and I'm happy to take any questions. persist or I, I've heard when you inject things into cells they eventually like die or decay or don't get reproduced or is this a, a, a one-off when the cell dies it dies or does it get carried through it and it, it carries through the uh, through the multiple generations oh, wow. uh, so that's the key so the the cell is constantly uh, dividing and growing so but the genetic message inherited from the circuits inherits generation to generation Okay, uh, I'm going to hand to my next speaker, John, uh, who's going to. Hello, everyone. My name is John Ulan, and I'm with the Future Analog Systems and Technologies Laboratory. And I'm going to tell you about my project, uh, developing an artifact cancellation circuit that enables bidirectional neural interfaces. For those of you that aren't familiar with neurobiology, uh, neuromodulation is the act of directly interfacing with neural tissue to produce a desired result. And this consists of stimulating neural tissue with uh, multiple forms of stimulus, whether that's electrical current pulses or pulses of light, and then recording what the neurons do in response. Now, strategically applied neuromodulation can be used to treat many neurophysiological disorders. For example, you can halt an epileptic seizure uh, in progress with strategically applied stimulation. You can prevent uh, OCD loops. You can also bridge gaps in uh, broken nervous system circuits. So if someone has their spinal cord damaged, you can uh, stimulate on the other side of that break and actually reanimate dead tissue. And there's a lot of work going on down at the medical school uh, to do just that right now. This is what a bidirectional uh, nervous interface looks like, and this is what you need to perform uh, full neuromodulation in a medical setting. It consists of a stimulation front end, which needs to apply a uh, biphasic balanced current pulse, and that's used to uh, elicit action potentials in nervous tissue. This uh, stimulation front end needs to be able to provide up to two milliamps of current and also be high voltage tolerant because the electrodes you use to interface with the nervous system are relatively high impedance. And then on the other side, you have a sensing front end, which consists of a low noise amplifier and an analog to digital converter that needs to record microvolt level uh, nervous system signals, which are coming directly from neuron cells. 
And the problem arises when you try and do these two things simultaneously, like you would in any sort of uh, medical circuit that uses a feedback loop. The problem is that the high voltages, up to 10 volts, created by the stimulation side, will propagate through the nervous tissue directly into your front end, which is tuned for microvolt level signals. And my project is to make the front end of the recording channel immune to those artifacts so you can stimulate and record at the same time, allowing you to see directly how the brain reacts to electrical stimulation. Now, we've previously developed a high voltage tolerant stimulator in our lab. Uh, the unique thing about this circuit is it uses actually low voltage, low power CMOS, which has a 1 volt and 2.5 volt voltage limit to provide a plus minus 10 volt stimulation pulse. And our current project uses an iteration of this stimulator on the same CMOS die as a high density recording channel that can simultaneously record from 64 electrodes all at once. And then my my innovation with this circuit is to create a canceller that uses information from both the stimulator and the recording channel on the same CMOS die to subtract a replica of the voltage artifact created during stimulation from the input of the recording channel. And uh, this is all done in real time with a uh, digital feedback loop. It's actually an adaptive finite impulse response filter using a least mean squared error update algorithm. Uh, it all gets very complicated in the digital design. And uh, we've been able to demonstrate up to 40 dB of cancellation at the front end of the recording channel. And what that does is it takes a voltage artifact that may be 1 to 10 volts and scales it down to about a millivolt, allowing you to actually record it with the recording front end. It prevents your analog amplifier from saturating and prevents you from losing neural data on the back end. And we're currently developing this chip in 65 nanometer CMOS. Our tape out is actually in about four days. So uh, this project should come to fruition, and we're excited to see some interesting results. And with that, uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. And thanks for listening about my work. Any questions? Yeah. How much added power do you think it will cost to uh, add the cancellation function? It, the digital feedback loop is about 200 microamps of static power. And the big pr overhead there is uh, enabling it for 64 individual channels. Because you need to store data for every single one of those channels as you're interleaving through them. Thank you. And next we have Dee presenting his work. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deason from Professor Carl Boringer's MAPS Research Lab. Today, I would like to introduce our self-cleaning surface technology using uh, transparent asymmetric uh, uh, ratchet conveyors. By microfabrication process, we'll create micro-sized patterns on the surface instead of uniform coating. With that uh, microstructure, we can control the water droplet movement on the surface and clean the surface contaminants away. Probably you already know that uh, we characterize the surface energy by applying water droplet and measure the surface contact angles. And uh, like the two pictures shown above, uh, if the surface is treated with HDMS material, the contact angle is smaller than 90 degree, meaning the surface is hydrophilic. And uh, the water droplets like to wet on the surface. And uh, if uh, we coated the surface with uh, FOTS material, the contact angle is larger than 90 degree, uh, which the surface is hydrophobic, meaning the, uh, the surface like to repel water. In our design, we create periodic uh, semicircular hydrophilic runs on the hydrophobic background. And uh, with this structure, we can control the water droplet movement. Uh, if the water droplet apply on this kind of surface, if you apply it with enough uh, 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 vibration, and the an uh, anisotropic pinning force of the leading and the trailing edge will, um, will uh, change the difference uh, during each vibration cycle. And the water droplet will move forward after uh, each vibrations. And based on this design, uh, we kind of uh, fabricate our two ratchet patterns on a four inch silicon wafer. Uh, each each uh, ratchet design is about 2.4 centimeter by 2.4 centimeter, and uh, we design a zigzag pattern so that the water droplet will kind of loop around the surface and uh, clean the surface multiple times. 
we also designed the surface uh, uh, gap between each, uh, each trace is like 1.5 millimeters. So like the water droplet trace can have a overlap between each other and uh, to cover the whole surface area. Uh, and for here, I would like to show a live demo here. I apply a nine microliter water droplet on the surface, and it cleans the surface contaminants, which is shown is the white color there. You can see the water droplets moves very fast. The speed is about three point millimeter uh, per second, and uh, it multiple uh, it uh, kind of loop the surface multiple times to make sure the surface is clean. And we need to take a look at how the water droplets. Uh, uh, deforms and uh, uh, during the vibration, and we take the characterization with a high-speed camera, and uh, uh, we we kind of uh, take uh, the measurement of the content of the leading edge and the trailing edge, also the uh, the the position change of the leading edge and the trailing edge. From here, you can see because of the anisotropic pinning force of the leading and the trailing edge, there is a contact angle difference, uh, hysteresis there, and also the. Uh, position change of the compression phase is larger than the expansion phase, uh, meaning the water droplet will kind of follow in one direction uh, after each vibration cycles. And also here is another demo. Uh, it's kind of 10 microliter water droplets carries two milligram sand, uh, which means our uh, 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 system has the capability of cleaning sand particles. We want to apply that to the uh, solar panel application because uh, the, the dust and the green uh, uh, accumulation can reduce the solar panel efficiency. And with our uh, system, we can kind of have the potential to continuously clean the solar panels and uh, boost the efficiency. And uh, as a summary, today I will just uh, introduce uh, our uh, asymmetric ratchet conveyor system and how it can choose the water droplet to move. And for the future plan, I would like to have a test on different surface contaminants and also uh, focus on the application for the solar panels. Uh, for here, I would like to uh, express my thanks to my advisor, Professor Carl Boringer, and also my lab mates, uh, Hal and uh, uh, Nere and Zhe Yi. Also, I would like to express my thanks to the engineers in the um, uh, Washington nanofabrication facility there. And I thank you so much for the listening. Thank you. Uh, questions? Oh, you can design different tracks. So this is kind of loop design, but you can just uh, have some other designs, just a single uh, loop, and then just go away. Yeah. OK, uh, let's just welcome the next speaker, Charles. Great, OK, thanks, y'all, for coming. Um, so let's consider a simple brain, which uh, is particularly a moth, okay, a moth, and the olfactory system of that moth. So it's just a few thousand neurons, uh, but that moth brain, that, that, that those few thousand neurons can learn new odors, okay? I think it's the simplest neural system we know pretty much that can learn something new. And so um, the question is, how does this simple system learn? So uh, the, that's the big question, given just a few, a handful of very simple uh, tools, how does this uh, simple neural system actually learn new data? And our approach is to build computational models, okay, uh, and to simulate the system. Two rules. First of all, we have to honor what's known about the system in the literature. And, and what's known in the literature uh, is kind of like the parable of the blind people uh, touching the elephant. Uh, lots of different experimenters try different things, and some stuff isn't known, there's disagreement, but as far as possible, we use what is known in, or known in the literature. Secondly, we have the advantage of actual data from Jeff Riffle's lab in biology, and uh, they have real moths, they give them real odors and give them real sugar to learn, and, so, and they also read the actual spike trains coming out of those neurons. So whatever else our models do, they have to match what reality is doing in the moths, and uh, so far we do pretty well on that. But that's a nice um, reality check that keeps our model from ending up in the land of Oz being a theoretical nice thing. Uh, it hopefully keeps us tethered. So given these models, what can we do? Well, first of all, we can run experiments a lot faster uh, than Jeff Riffle can because it's easier to push the go button on your simulation than to work with a moth brain. Um, and secondly, there's a lot of disagreement in the, in, in the literature about the architecture of this system or the components in it, and we're able to easily trade out those hypotheses and say, well, does this give feasible results? Does this give results that match reality? Um, 
So basically, we're using it as a tool to explore, the, to, to probe the system and try to analyze what's going on. So uh, that's all very nice. The next obvious question is, why do we care? And it, it, it's good to know if you're going to research something. So I'll try to motivate that briefly. Uh, here's a, a simple cartoon of the uh, system. And uh, the signal moves from the antenna on the left over to the readout neurons on the right. The uh, lack of knowledge about the system increases as you move toward the right. So the left is relatively reasonably well known. On the right, there's a lot of unknowns about how that learning occurs and how that memory occurs. Um, but, and there's a lot of intrinsically interesting things about the system. Uh, but I want to highlight a, a few of them because they're counterintuitive. They're in the lower left here. So the first thing is the quality control on this system is appalling, right? The components, the sensors, the neurons, the response inhibition in this system are, are, are incredibly variable. And we think of bad quality control, for example, in your components in the lab as a bad thing, right? But in this case, it has benefits. And secondly, these neurons are incredibly noisy. They are constantly firing when they shouldn't or, or shouldn't. They are um, not firing when they seem they should. And uh, we think of noise as a bad thing. And there's a lot of noise in the system. But there are, it turns out, beneficial math mathematical properties for noise in this context for this system. Thirdly, there's randomness baked into this system. We think of randomness as bad. Our laptops are not randomly architected, right? But in this case, for example, neurons pretty much connect to whatever they connect to. And the system has to make it work. And so we have a system here where high noise and high randomness are actually not liabilities, but assets. Um, so anyone have kids? <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's old news, right? But we're applying it to this context. Um, and, and the second thing I want to highlight is in the lower right, this notion of generalized stimulation for learning. So uh, when we do machine learning, we're optimizing a function, we use backprop, we use gradient descent. This moth, when it gets a new odor, it has to find a way to, to track that new odor. It has to search a solution space for an optimal solution to how to include that new coding. And the mechanism it seems to use is to generally stimulate the system. When you um, open that pizza box to, to teach your moth, let's say, to, to love pizza, and you waft the odor over it and you give it sugar, this um, neuron uh, in blue down here will spray the whole system with octopamine, a chemical that generally stimulates everything. It, it just makes everything fire more. It's like jiggling the box. And somehow that induces learning. And if you don't have that generalized stimulation from octopamine, there is no learning. So somehow that's the mechanism that this moth is using to uh, optimize and, and, and explore its search space and find optimal solutions. And we're very curious how that and why that system works. So there's the target. Uh, thank you to my committee. Uh, works on this. This is one of these porous projects that moves to other departments, because which happens a lot in Double E. And thanks to uh, the organizers of this event who have kept it on track. Great job. And thanks to all of you. Right. Any quick questions? Yeah. So is this like reinforcement learning and machine learning, the, the randomness and the exploration? Uh, it, it probably is some form of that, yeah. And so, because basically you give it sugar and it now knows something is of interest, right? But um, how that works is unclear. But yeah, there must be a tie to that, right? Okay, well thank you so much. And I'd like you all to give it up to, uh, we've all been warm up bands for Ban, who's coming next with his research, her research, I'm sorry. Hello everyone, I am Ban and my advisor is Georg Selig. Today, I want to talk about investigating how changes in DNA affect protein production. In 2003, the Human Genome Project was complete and genome sequences were accessible since then. But as we know, this project took tremendous money. Fortunately, compared to the cost back then, now, nowadays we can sequence a human genome for less than $1,000. That means if you are interested, you can have your sequence in hand. As a consequence, now we have a very comprehensive catalog of sequence variations that happens between different people. But our ability to understand and interpret these differences is still poor. So what we want to do is develop a massively parallel approach for understanding, understanding the genome. 
our approach would combine synthetic biology, DNA sequencing, and machine learning, and will result in predictive models about how changes in DNA would affect the protein production. So in order to build such models, we need a lot of data. And typically, for applications in all fields, more data is better. For example, in 2012, Google let the computer see millions of pictures randomly taken from YouTube videos. And the computer never been told what a cat was, but it discovered what a cat looked like finally by itself through learning from tons of data. In our case, it's not sufficient to rely solely on the nature sequences provided provide just naturally because there are only 20,000 genes in human genome, and this number is way too small compared to the number of data needed for training, which is in the order of millions. So we need to create our own library composed of millions of members with synthetic sequences. So variants happen everywhere. What we are interested in is in the process of gene expression, where DNA stores the gene, sorry, DNA stores genetic information, gets copied into RNA, and this process is called transcription, then followed by the process called translation, where cellular ribosomes create protein decoded from RNA. So the center graph shows an abstract representation of a typical human mRNA. Actually, only the green box called coding sequence directly code for protein. All other regions collaborate and control when and where the protein are expressed. The genetic code has been discovered to explain the re re relationship between coding sequence and protein. So understanding the variants in the non-coding regions are really the challenges we are facing. The great thing about our approach is that it can be used to study any of these non-coding regulatory regions. And specifically, in my research project, I am interested in the region called Fibran UTR, short for Fibran Untranslated Region. So in order to study Fibran UTR region, we built up this one million member library with just a randomized new uh, basis. Wow. And using the high throughput DNA synthetics techniques. And then we ran the library through a massively parallel assay to co collect one million data points uh, and then apply this result to the machine learning algorithm to build up this predictive model. And the massive parallel assay we are using here is based on ribosome profiling. We introduce the five prime UTR library into the cells and let the cells translate on them. Oh, why is jumping? Okay. Um, okay, let the cells translate on them and when the is, translation is going on in the cell, multiple ribosomes come in and bind to the mRNA and slice through mRNA to decode for protein. And one noticed thing is that multi uh, more ribosomes binding to mRNA would mean this mRNA has higher translation efficiency. And the fact is that for each ribosome, it protects around 30 bases of mRNA fragment, which is called ribosome footprint. So after some sort of experimental manipulation, we can collect the ribosome footprints globally and sequencing them using next generation DNA sequencing. That means then in some way we can associate the uh, ribosome footprint back to the variant in 5' UTR. That means for each member in the 5' UTR library, we can collect a footprint density data for that variant. And then we generate a one million data points of data set after this one experiment. And with that, we can uh, uh, build our predictive model based on the data set we are collecting and then to investigate how changes in fiber UTR affect the translation. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? Yes. What is your training system, your machine learning? So uh, right now we are still in the uh, early stage of our project. We are using a very uh, simple linear regression right now, but, but furthermore, we're probably gonna try different nonlinear um, systems such as neural network, et cetera. Okay. Okay, thank you. So let's welcome Hal.
Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Hal Holmes. I'm in uh, Dr. Carl Bringer's lab, and uh, I'm working on a, a droplet uh, liquid handling platform that we've developed in our lab uh, to apply towards uh, medical diagnostics. So uh, healthcare costs are actually one of the fastest growing segments of the U.S. economy. Uh, currently accounts for almost 18% of the U.S. GDP, and that's only predicted to increase unless measures are taken to curb healthcare spending. Uh, so for these reasons, there's a, there's a major uh, need for uh, new innovations that can reduce the cost of, of delivering health care to, to American patients. Uh, and so we believe that, that reducing the cost and improving the efficiency of, of diagnostic platforms uh, and devices can, uh, can really have an impact on this problem. Uh, and so in, in the Beringer Lab, we have a, a new type of uh, microfluidic system that, that handles liquids in the form of small discrete droplets. And so working with droplets, we can use smaller samples from patients, uh, and this requires fewer reagents, which are really the, the expensive uh, biological components in diagnostic devices. Uh, and then the small sample size and large surface area can also allow you to perform faster processes, uh, improving the, the throughput uh, of, of diagnostic procedures. Uh, and so uh, our, our ARC system that, that you've heard a little bit about today uh, really uh, enables droplet transport through uh, two key features. The first is an asymmetric surface pattern uh, composed of these uh, hydrophilic rungs defined by hydrophobic uh, background. And this creates a difference in pinning forces on the leading and trailing edges of a droplet. So the second part is a orthogonal vibration that's actually applied to the substrate uh, beneath the droplet, uh, such as with a small speaker. And this causes the droplet to cycle through wetting, de-wetting, and equilibrium phases. And so essentially, the, the combination of these two features causes the droplet to take a step through each vibration cycle. Uh, and our, uh, our ARC devices are really, they're really made using the same, same techniques and same equipment that's used to make computer chips. Uh, so we can produce these for uh, you know, f uh, relatively inexpensively and can take advantage of that, that uh, uh, upscale manufacturing and, and uh, economy to scale. And so I make all of these devices uh, on campus at the Washington Nanofabrication Facility. And it's a pretty simple process. I start with an oxidized silicon wafer, uh, apply a pattern photoresist, photo resist, and you can see the, the arc pattern uh, and the photoresist here, and then deposit a hydrophobic siline to create the, the hydrophobic background. And when I strip the, strip the, the resist, really have a transparent pattern of the uh, hydrophilic silicon dioxide rungs uh, defined by the hydrophobic siline, and we can see the difference in uh, in the native contact angles uh, below. And so here's actually a video from the side of the droplet uh, moving in slow motion. And so you can see that as each vibration uh, occurs, the droplet uh, moves forward on the substrate. And in real time, you can see the droplet does move quite quickly. Uh, however, in order to enable an automated diagnostic device, we need to be able to mo do more than just move a droplet forward. Uh, so I've been expanding uh, our, our functional toolbox by adding other droplet functions. And so here we can see that with the same arc pattern, uh, just by changing the, the vibrational signal, or really the volume of the signal, we can get the droplet to pass through this intersection or to, to turn uh, and selectively control the direction of the transported droplet. So we can see the different, uh, really di different displacement amplitudes of the vibration here. And so in conclusion, uh, droplet-based uh, microfluidic systems, uh, they have a lot of potential to serve as low-cost diagnostic devices. And uh, our ARC platform looks to take advantage of that by providing a, a, simple, uh, a, a simple device that can be mass manufactured uh, using uh, conventional uh, microfabrication techniques. And we can selectively control droplet uh, transport. And furthermore, the, the fabrication process allows for module integration, such as uh, electronic sensors or other uh, microfabricated components. So here's actually an example of the droplet being driven uh, over a set of integrated microheaters. Um, and uh, so in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to thank, uh, thank my lab, uh, my advisor, Dr. Carl Bringer, and uh, all of my lab mates who've uh, uh, really contributed to this project and, uh, and, uh, and for all of their help, and as well as our, our sponsors, and especially the, the uh, engineers uh, and everyone that works at the Washington Nanofabrication Facility who is really essential to this project. Uh, and so I'd take any questions now if anyone has any. Thank you. All right, if there are no questions, then oh, we got one question. So are these um, also water droplets that are collecting something, or are these like biological fluids? Uh, so right now I'm working with water droplets trying to uh, determine the underlying physical mechanisms behind these. But in the future, we would use blood samples or urine samples, or they would contain, um, they would contain biological 
uh, specimens. All right, uh, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Pei Fang. Thank you, Hao. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Pei Feng Jin from Professor Li Ling's Photonics Lab. And today, I'm, my presentation is about our MEMS mass sensing device integrated with nanostructured enhanced optical tweezers for biological studies. Uh, first of all, let me ask a, a question. Uh, do you care about your healthy weight? <laughs> OK, I guess most of you have done this before, at least. Uh, so if you do so, you need three tools. First of all, you need a measuring tape to measure your height, and then you need a scale to measure your weight. As long as with two, these two values, you can look it up in a, a weight chart and figure it out whether you are at an ideal weight, right? But the same thing happens in biology, but biologists care more about cells, and they want to know how does the cell, uh, what's the volume of the cell, and what's the weight of the cell during the cell growth. Um, so uh, there are, uh, they are very uh, important metrics in cell biology. Uh, for example, uh, we all know that the cell uh, can grow bigger and heavier, but how does the cell regulate its weight and volume during its growth? This is one question. Another example is uh, we, we know that one cell can divide it in, into two cells, but how does the cell know when to divide and what's the checkpoint in this process? So all of these questions uh, are very significant in um, cell biologists. Uh, by answering these questions, we can get better on, on, not us, but biologists, can get better understanding of the cell cycles and the cell growth so that they can develop, uh, uh, well, they can find more or better treatments for disease. And then uh, by, get, uh, by getting these better understandings, they can develop new drugs uh, that can predictably modulate the cell growth. But all these questions related to the cell mass or cell weights are not fully answered nowadays. So what is missing here? Uh, we have microscope and many optical measurements uh, that can measure the volume of the cell or the size of the cell. Uh, but what we lack here is the scale that can measure the weight of the cell. Uh, it is difficult because the cell is too light and it's only about one over one followed by 11 zeros of a chicken egg. So you see, it's almost nothing, and it's very difficult to measure such a small weight. Therefore, we need a very precise and sensitive skill to measure such a small weight. So what we develop, uh, what we propose here is a MEMS mass sensing device, uh, like, like here. So what we do is we deliver the cells through the microfluidic channel to onto the bridge. The bridge is always vibrating up and down uh, at its natural frequency. So when the cell in, this, uh, in the microfluidic channel settles down and begin, uh, and begin to grow heavier, uh, the mass of the bridge changes so that the vibrating frequency changes. Therefore, we can detect the mass change of the cell by uh, measuring the frequency shifts of the vibrating. So also here we use optical uh, tweezers to fix the cell at a certain position on this bridge to achieve a higher accuracy. Uh, the optical tweezer is just a laser uh, that can manipulate the cell as what we like. So in this red picture, we show the, uh, well, the, the each cells are patterning a ring pattern here, just to show the manipulations. Uh, but the problem is the laser will cause photo damage to the cell, and it's a very significant issue in biology. Therefore, we fabricate the surface of the bridge to be uh, the green picture, like uh, some periodical holes that can reduce the photo damage on the cell and uh, prolong the cell's lifetime. Uh, and this picture, uh, this histogram shows the better confinement by using this uh, nanostructured device. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge my advisor and group mates and uh, uh, Washington Nano Fabrication Facilities and NSF funding. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Question. How do you get rid of the extra cells in your microfluidic channels? Oh. Uh, so basically, we have two ports on the two sides. And the ports are super big. And we pump the uh, cells and the liquid from the ports and get rid of the, some other cells from it. 
uh, the other ports. Thank you. So let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Tyler. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Tyler and I'm working in the ISDL lab under Les Atlas. And today I'm gonna be talking to you about encoding harmonic sounds in cochlear implants. Uh, so I thought I'd start this off by playing a bit of a game. Uh, what I'm gonna do is introduce three things to you and just tell me what the outlier is. What thing fits in the least? So we'll start off, we've got Jimi Hendrix, Beethoven, and Stevie Ray Vaughan. Shout it out. Beethoven, okay, that was the test. Uh, next one, we've got a clarinet, saxophone, and guitar. Okay, you guys are getting good at this. Uh, finally, this is a little trickier, about these three figures. Number one, right? So interestingly, what you're looking at here are the electrical stimulation patterns that you might hear if you had a cochlear implant and you were listening to one of these different instruments. We want to have the stimulation sound like uh, one of these right figures here, but we get these weird artifacts coming in with the clarinet, and I'll be coming back to why that is in just a second. So a cochlear implant is a device that allows the deaf to hear. It bypasses the acoustic um, hearing mechanism and just directly stimulates the auditory nerve with electrical, uh, electrical simulations. And uh, before that happens, some signal processing needs to be done on the input audio signal. And that system is based on the vocoder. So the way a vocoder works is you've got two input sources. One of them is typically a voice, and the second one is something musical. They're both broken up by filter banks into subband signals, and then envelopes are extracted from the first source and applied to the second one. If you didn't understand any of that, I want to give you guys a quick idea of what exactly that sounds like. So. Okay, so I've got a keyboard here that I'm playing. And I can apply my voice to that. Check, check, one, two. Hello, everybody. Intergalactic, planetary, planetary, intergalactic. <laughs> okay, so the interesting thing that you'll notice is that you could understand what I'm saying there, but a lot of the characteristics of my voice are missing. And specifically, the pitch of the sound that you're hearing is not coming from my voice. It's coming from that second source. It's coming from the keyboard. Um, so if we loop this back to a cochlear implant, what a cochlear implant does is breaks up our source and extracts envelopes from it, but rather than applying those to a second source, we're just using those to control the amplitude of uh, electrical stimuli inside the cochlea. So something you might be wondering in this case is if we don't have a second source, where is the pitch of the signal coming from? So coming back to the example that we had with these instruments here, if we zoom in on the saxophone, there's a temporal modulation going on. And sure enough, the period of this temporal modulation is one over the pitch of the signal. So for our saxophone and our guitar, we're going to have a pitch. And for the clarinet, there's not gonna be any pitch. And let's figure out why exactly that's happening. If we look at the frequency domain of the saxophone, the energy of the signal is distributed at harmonic frequencies, which are integer multiples of the pitch. We apply our filter bank to it, and if we look at one of these filters specifically, we see that within this filter, we've got two harmonics that land within the uh, bandwidth. As a result, the output envelope is gonna have a beat frequency which is equal to the difference between the two harmonics. And sure enough, that's always gonna be our pitch. But if we look at the clarinet, clarinet is an interesting instrument in that it only has odd harmonics. So even though we're playing the exact same note on the clarinet, only one harmonic falls within our bandwidth. And as a result, there's no beat frequencies and the cochlear implant user doesn't get any pitch cues. What if we came up with a different system? We could use a pitch tracker to estimate the pitch, 
and then develop an adaptive filter bank where each of these filters has the job of extracting a single harmonic of the signal. We look at one of these filters specifically, we see that independent of what the input is, we're isolating a single harmonic and there's no temporal modulations on either of them. But we just figured out what the pitch was with our pitch estimator. So we could synthesize a carrier with the rate of the pitch and apply that to any of these instruments. And in contrast to our previous system, we've got a, a pitch cue on any of the instruments. And hopefully as a result, we have less people feeling confused. So, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So why does the clarinet have such a different behavior than the other wind instruments or what have you? Um, so, I, I would like to point out that this is a nice example. It's something just to relate to because of the odd harmonics of the clarinet. But these artifacts that you're seeing here are things that are gonna be going on through all sorts of different things. Even on a clarinet, as you're changing the uh, pitch of that instrument, it's gonna have all these different artifacts happening in the cochlear implant processing. Um, and with that, I'll introduce our last speaker, Bora. Everyone, uh, my name is Bora, and my advisor is Professor Sam Burden, and we work in the biorobotics lab. So today, my talk is estimating predictive dynamical models of legged locomotion from data. So now you may say, why predictive models? Well, these models in locomotion can serve as low-cost and low-effort low prototyping tools. Uh, generally, in locomotion, steady state is considered a starting point. We then hope to expand the scope of these models to predict perturbation. So this video on the left shows a cockroach running at steady state. Uh, the cannon attached to its back then fires, applying a perturbation. So now, uh, okay, so this video is playing. Then we want to expand the scope of these models to also include uh, the ability to predict various treatments. So in this video, uh, we see un subjects or undergraduates running through an obstacle course, and they have these various treatments applied to them. So they have this backpack that's either filled or this weird wooden contraption that changes their moment of inertia. So now to the experiment I'm working on. This video is not playing. So this is a single trial of our experiment that we're analyzing. Uh, we're using the cockroach or Blabbers discodalis. This is a slowed down video of that same trial. So as you can see in the beginning, the cockroach is running across the cart. The cart is stationary. At zero milliseconds, the cart begins to accelerate to the right and the cockroach keeps running. And so the goal of this experiment was to collect data on the cockroach's steady state locomotion, the cockroach's response to perturbations, in this case, the accelerating cart, and the cockroach's response to various treatments. So the lower left is the control treatment. So it's just a balsa wood backpack that's glued to its back. Uh, the lower right is where they add a mass to it, and the top one is the moment of inertia treatment. So when devising a model for this uh, cockroach, we, uh, we observed that cockroaches locomote with an alternating tripod gate. And you can see that as it's highly stereotyped, uh, or the three tripods are in this figure. We then propose a simple mechanism to explain the cockroach's uh, motion, uh, that its body acceleration is determined by the pose relative to the stance tripod. Or in other words, uh, the cockroach's acceleration is a function of its body's position versus its feet. Then for each step of the cockroach, we identify the three feet that are currently in stance, uh, and we place a step frame. And the step frame is uh, origin is the average of the three feet. Uh, the orientation of the set frame is found through principal component analysis and then picking the principal component. We then fit a potential function. I'll kind of gloss over the details. Uh, it's energy conservative for each step and it has three dimensions, the X position, the Y position, and theta, the body orientation. A benefit of this form is that we can easily account for novel perturbations or treatments. Uh, the goal, uh, yeah, the gold uh, M term, the mass matrix or inertia tensor allows us to account for treatments such as the the backpack, the purple A term allows us to plug in uh, a perturbation signal such as an accelerating cart, and these are results. So this is just the uh, steady state locomotion of the cockroach, so it's with respect to phase, so that's progress through the stride, where a stride is composed of two steps. Uh, and then on the X, or on the Y axis we have X acceleration, which is the four aft acceleration, and these are our model's results. So the blue dash line is a leading competitor, the lateral leg spring, uh, the red dash line is a piecewise Hamiltonian, and as you can see, uh, our model generally stays, uh, is closer in agreement with the empirical distribution. 
Then for the lateral acceleration, here we actually have an interesting biological finding. Uh, generally, it's considered, or uh, conventional yet unsupported wisdom posits that at zero and 50% phase, the step transition, the cockroach should be ex experiencing zero lateral acceleration. Our empirical distribution shows that's not true, and our model uh, successfully predicts that. And then finally, in the case of rotational acceleration, uh, we're again recovering the phasing correctly, unlike the lateral leg spring model, and doing a better job. And I'd finally like to end by thanking my collaborators and my advisor, and thank you for your time. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. I think uh, you'd have to go, what I would recommend is go to TEDx, type in Robert Full, and you'll talk about cockroaches and all the crazy things they can do. Basically, they're amazing creatures. Long story short, they're very adaptable and resilient. And I'd like to thank the organizers. Thank you. So I would just like to close by thanking everyone again. Uh, thank you for all the speakers for working on this. Um, I, I hope you all had fun, learned something from each other, and I would like to thank uh, the GSA and organizers committee, everyone, all the teams, uh, video team, PR teams, my, my advisor, Professor Ostendor, for sending all the spamming emails on our behalf. Um, and yeah, if you have questions, more questions, feel free to come down. The speakers will be here for a bit. And um, if you're interested in presenting next year, helping organize next year, here's our email. And thank you. <laughs>